I'm so excited to be here. And I think every speaker up until this point has said that. I heard Freek say it. Everyone's excited to be here uh, because after two years of sitting inside, this is only my second physical talk after doing uh, 25 uh, webinars. So uh, yeah, that, that kind of sucked. But this is my 255th one, and I'm really excited to do this here with you. But before we can talk about whatever I'm going to talk about, I need to do a little bit of a vibe check, a crowd check. And I've done this in the past through a couple of statements that I present to the audience as a sort of crowd participation. Now, if you're more the introverted type, don't worry. We're among friends here. You don't have to respond. If you're a, a bit of the loud mouth type, don't hesitate to make some noise, stand up, uh, do whatever you want. I come bearing gifts as well. So I have like two tote bags, one uh, with a book and one with pairs of socks that I can randomly throw in the audience. So let's, uh, let's, they're pretty cool socks, I have to admit. Okay, so are you ready, Amsterdam? Are you ready for this? Yeah. Yes, all right. I love this. This is cool about the Netherlands. Like they're a bit louder than the Belgians. Okay, statement number one. Ladies and gentlemen, do we agree that slow websites suck? Yeah. Yes, all right, all right. I'm gonna, I'm gonna start spreading socks here for the, for, the, for the front rows. All right, very good. Do we also agree? that web performance is an essential part of the user experience. Yes, yes. all right, all right, all right. Let's, let's keep flowing, let's keep flowing. Third one, maybe slightly more controversial. I, I'll keep a couple for the people at the back, back rows. I'm gonna keep them there. Uh, third one, a slow website is just as bad as a website that is down. Maybe a bit more controversial. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, if it happens though, uh, you'll lose money, lose face, might even lose a little bit of Google page rank on that. And what a lot of people do is, is try to mitigate that with infrastructure, throwing servers at the problem. So we, uh, we have a problem with capacity, let's add capacity. But that's not really sustainable in the long run. And on a short-term basis, don't get me wrong, when the house is on fire, firefighting needs to happen. But this will cost you a lot of money in the long run. And this is just looking at the symptoms rather than at the root cause. And as the famous poet Notorious B.I.G. once said, more money, <laughs> more servers, more problems. Thank you, thank you. That joke doesn't always work, so I'm happy it does here. So what do you do? Well, at the other end of the spectrum, you can say, let's identify the slowest parts and optimize them, which makes total sense, right? We're in a room full of developers. Optimize the code, optimize the stack, optimize the infrastructure, the network, whatever you have. Optimize it. And that makes perfect sense. You should do that. But after a while, you hit the point of diminishing returns, which means you're throwing in so much developer money. Yes, you guys cost a lot of money on an hourly basis. And after, in the beginning, you'll get lots of gains, but after a while, that will end. And uh, that's that's why I present you a door number three, caching. Caching, and I use the metaphor of the boxes quite explicitly, is storing computed results in these boxes for later use, because having the computed value ready is uh, a lot more efficient. That being said, hi, my name is Thijs. Uh, as you can hear by the name, I'm, uh, I'm Dutch speaking, I'm Belgium. Hallo aan alle Nederlands sprekende mensen. And hi to all everyone who speaks English in here. I'm the technical evangelist at a company called Varnish Software. For those who have or have not heard about us, uh, we're the company behind the open source project, fairly popular open source project, Varnish Cash. We're also the creators of Varnish Enterprise, which is more of our commercial deal. Now, from the numbers, I could say that about 9 million websites worldwide, give or take, use Varnish. And if you look at the top ones, 21% of the top 10,000 websites trust our technology. It's pretty cool. If you want to reach me afterwards, or if you want to heckle me right now, uh, I have a habit of that happening. Uh, I'm at Teisfrin on the social media. Uh, Twitter might be the best one in, in this context. I'm the author of Getting Started with Varnish Cash, which is an older book. Uh, this is my new one, which I brought here in this nice tote bag. It's Varnish 6 by example. This is my what did you do during the lockdown story. <laughs> Big flex, uh, two kilos, 778 pages, will be raffled to someone at the end of this presentation. So I'll keep it front and center, maybe put it down. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You could use it as a doorstop. Uh, so here's, here's, the, here's the start of it. When a user connects to a server, depending on two factors, this might become problematic. If there's too many of these users, well, the system may get overwhelmed because of connection limits, not even because the server is unhealthy, connection limits, but also because there's just too much resources being consumed, too high of a load. The other end is, if the server is outputting content that is too computationally heavy, it doesn't take a lot to, to bring it down. So what's the alternative? Adding a reverse caching proxy. So a proxy server that caches, and that is reverse. What would that mean? Well, here's a drawing. Here's how that works. 
This is your server, this is your Laravel application, this is the client consuming it, and then in the middle you have a proxy that caches the responses coming from the server. But because it's a reverse proxy, it sits at the data center area in a traditional web acceleration setup. If you look at it from a more content delivery perspective, this proxy will be closer to the user, but not in the office like the old school proxies we had in the 90s. It, will, it is the outer tier of your application. It is what we call the edge, hence the title taking it Laravel and uh, to the edge with HTTP. This edge, this proxy system, of course, comes as no surprises varnish. So we're, we'll be talking about that. And I always add this picture, like Freak doesn't have the monopoly on funny Nickelback pictures. I, I use, who's seen this movie? Bodyguard. Yes, of course, someone remembered that you can be loud here amongst friends. It's the bodyguard. So this is Kevin Costner. This is Whitney Houston. When in doubt, right? Laravel, varnish. <laughs> right? So a lot, not a lot of people know. So some people know about varnish, some don't. When in doubt, think of the bodyguard. Think of Kevin and Whitney. Now, one may say, yeah, but you, you've just tried solving a problem where one server is prone to a lot of heavy load, and you just put one server in front of it, and your, your problems will be solved. Well, in extreme cases, your problems won't be solved, but Varnish is built for performance. It is built by, it was originally invented by Paul Henning Kamp, which is one of the core contributors of FreeBSD. Uh, most of the people using a Mac have code that is written by him in the operating system. He said, you know what? What if we could use all the nice little kernel tricks that most developers don't use and build something that is bulletproof? In a lab, Intel benchmarked our setup and managed to get 500 gigabits per second out of a single machine. So that's not bad at all, right, is it? And you can easily uh, process 100,000 requests a second. Not in combination with 500 gigabits per second of bandwidth, of course. And sub-millisecond latency when you have something cached. So it's, it's a powerhouse. You will, when you exhaust resources on the server, it won't be the RAM, it won't be the CPU, it will more likely be your network interface. The cool thing about Varnish is, like, even if you're not too familiar with Varnish, it leverages the power of HTTP. And let's, let's, let's have a look. Maybe I should take these socks again. Uh, let's check. So we have a header here. Cache control, public max H, 3,600. How long will Varnish cache this? Yeah, I saw you. Here you go. Well deserved. Uh, here's another one, a more trick question. This requires another pair of socks. How long will the, ca the cache store this? Come again, louder. A day. a day, yes, and why is that? <laughs> Still, you've earned this. Uh, a day indeed, because in HTTP, S max H stands for shared max H, it's for shared devices, and varnish. And any other proxy is a shared device. The naming convention is a bit off, max dash h, s max h, so yeah, it gets a bit tricky. So the browser will cache for an hour, varnish will cache for a day. This is an expression when you don't want it to be cached. When either of these statements, not all of them conjoined, but either of these statements appears, varnish won't cache. And here's an extra piece of information, stale while revalidate 300. Stale while revalidate is uh, the official implementation, we call it grace in varnish, and that means if content has expired, 300 seconds beyond the initial TTL, we can serve stale content while we do a backend fetch. So that means users aren't, uh, aren't really uh, caught up in, in all that mess and don't have to wait. They get the old stuff and you can control that. If you set this to zero, well, they, they have to wait and you, you don't tolerate uh, stale content. Here's another one, Vary. Who's heard of the Vary header? Very few people. Well, Vary is a way of creating a cache variation, meaning when an object is identified by its full URL, you might depend on maybe the accept encoding or the accept language or the protocol for the visualization. Let's say uh, you have Dutch content, well, the accept language equals NL will present Dutch content. Uh, in other cases, maybe it might be English, but the cache isn't aware of this. By issuing a vary header, you can make the cache aware. Okay, so that was all the cool stuff. So uh, HTTP comes with tons of nice syntax to issue caching. But this is the real world, the world where we use cookies. Almost every website uses cookies. I set up Laravel a couple of days ago. It starts issuing cookies. Cookies aren't cacheable. They're for your eyes only. They're private content. So Varnish doesn't cache it. So here's a little bit of a strange story. Like, so Varnish respects HTTP and uh, can all, use all these cache control headers. But as soon as a, there's a cookie, Varnish can't cache. Like, do we know websites in this day and age that don't use cookies? Probably not. So is the conclusion then that varnish can't be used in real life? 
Of course not. And that's why we have a full-blown programming language built into Varnish called the Varnish Configuration Language. It's a, it's, it has plenty of capabilities. It's curly braces style, looks a bit like C, does request handling, request routing. You can manipulate responses, select multiple backends, take all uh, sorts of decisions when it comes to caching, and also do decision making on the edge. Of course, uh, it is not a top-down programming language. It is a language that hooks into this finite state machine. A lot of information, not for the day, but there are all these subroutines you can hook in, and there is a flow from receiving a request to hashing it. It might be a cache hit, you'll deliver it, or it might be a miss, you'll fetch it. So all these things happen. It has standard behavior, and you can extend it. Here's a very basic and out-of-context example where we connect to a server hosted on the same machine on port 8080. When we receive a request, we check its URL, and if it starts with or matches this regular expression, which means an admin panel, please do not cache pass the request. So we follow the red path all the way down here. And under other circumstances, we just remove the cookies because we don't need them. Very out of context, maybe not applicable on Laravel, but I wanted to show a quick example. Now, this is not a VCL talk. So if you have VCL problems, I feel bad for you, son. I got 99 problems. No, uh, just go to Stack Overflow, use hash varnish. I'll get a notification in my mailbox. I'll answer your question. I'll be around if you have specific varnish questions. Talk to me. I will be skipping q and I'll use all the time I have. And, uh, or you could just drop me an email if you have a very specific question. But enough of the intro. Like I showed you what you can do in general. Let's apply it to Laravel. Now, a word of warning, important disclaimer, I'm not a Laravel expert. I installed my first Laravel application last week. Uh, I have a little bit more experience with Symfony, but it's a bit potato, potato. Uh, and uh, we ended up doing a couple of nice things. Here's how we started. Like I used that cache headers middleware to declare that the resource is public, cache be cached for an hour, and we're generating an e tag. And we apply that to this route, to our homepage, and the view gets rendered, and life is good. Or at least I thought it was good, because this is what I get. And I marked the red stuff as things I don't quite like. So out of the box, it starts issuing cookies which I hate, I absolutely hate. And I know it makes sense from a security point of view, from an authentication point of view, but I do not want this. I do not want that token on my homepage. I do not want to have a session because I don't know whether or not I'm going to log in or need all that metadata. And I definitely don't like that no cache private. So what I had to do is wrap this without middleware and mark this stuff and all of a sudden it started working. Now I only apply this to this homepage route. Maybe there are routes out there that do need to set cookie in that case. Uh, it, it will work fine. And then we have what we want, uh, public max h, uh, 3,600, and this ETAC. Who's familiar with ETAC? Just uh, by show of hands. Uh, for those of you who aren't, this is a sort of fingerprint that in Laravel is composed through an MD5 hash of the response content, and you use it to only fetch payload that has changed. It's part of the conditional request, as we call it. So normally, when you get a response back, you get 200 OK. And thanks to that e-tag and, and, and some magic behind the scenes, if the content hasn't changed, you can do a 304 not modified. And that's where the gains are to be made. So Varnish supports this kind of stuff. So you, send a, you emit an e-tag, and Varnish will send, look at this, an if non match. And your browser will do that as well under most circumstances with the last known e-tag. And it will you do it for the content negotiation. And if your application figures out that the content hasn't changed, you can just Emit 304 not modified. Look, the values are the same. Uh, we cache uh, for another hour, and it's just a reset. The number one benefit is less data over the wire, but you can, you can take it up and tune it up a notch. If you validate quickly and exit early, there's other gains to be made, big ones, like in terms of memory, in terms of CPU, in terms of accessing, not having to access the database, in terms of not having to bootstrap the full framework. And I wrote a little bit of middleware for that. It's called not modified. Uh, we get the request. If the content is not cacheable, don't bother. Send it to the next one. But if it is a cacheable method, we use the internal Laravel cache, create this e-tag key, read from the URL. And if we have the e-tag stored, we can emit it immediately. So we create a new response and call this magic is not modified. And if it's not modified, we'll return immediately. So we exit very early on. So no need to do all the other logic, because we know the content hasn't changed. That's why we need to have quick access to some sort of cache that can store the e-tag, and uh, possibly also the cache control to reset it. And otherwise, if you don't reach that level, you just dispatch the response and then store it in the cache for later use. That's how. Is this the best possible way? I'm not sure, but it 
worked for me, it's an idea, please recycle the idea and turn it into something better, because I think we have a lot of Laravel knowledge here uh, sitting in this room. Talk to me afterwards, by all means. Here's another problem we're faced. Imagine that you have this typical layout, header, navigation, main, footer. This is how web pages actually look, including the colors probably and the font size. Uh, but the header will contain maybe shopping cart information, maybe a, a login uh, screen like welcome, taste. Well, it's pretty clear that the header cannot be cached. But since this is one response, you're dealing with the largest common denominator, and there is no caching happening at all, despite the rest of the content being cacheable. And that's where placeholders come into play, and that's quite nice. Placeholders uh, will have separate HTTP requests for specific parts of the content. Anyone has, a, has an idea what kind of technology you could use for that? JavaScript, Ajax. Yes, Ajax. Look at that, Ajax. <laughs> Anything else? Edge side includes. Yes, sir. Very well. Uh, and that's what we're going to talk about. Edge side includes. Who remembers server side includes from back in the day? Who's old enough for that? Yeah, it's a bit of that, but not processed on the server, but on the edge. And now you know what the edge means, right? The outer tier. So that means Varnish will process this. If you put this in your code, Varnish will take the header, send a sub request internally, and compose it as a single piece of content uh, on the way out. However, we'll take uh, all the bits and pieces into account, so that means state per block, TTL per block, so you could decide not to cache the header and the rest can be cached. So how we're going to do this? We're going to do a little bit of content negotiation. Uh, so Varnish will send, if we tweak the VCL to that extent, a surrogate capability header and will announce ESI support. And it's up to your Laravel application to look for that header. And if it has it, if you're sitting behind something that has surrogate capability, well, then it's your turn to take surrogate control. Then you emit that surrogate control header, uh, throw out the ESI tag, and then Varnish will do the rest. This is the VCL code you need for that. Pretty simple. Uh, hooking into the, re the, the request, set the header, surrogate capability. And when the backend response comes back, just prior to storing the object in the cache, we check if the backend response has an HTTP header called surrogate control, it should match that value. We unset it, and here's the magic line, do ESI true. And then all of that get, gets parsed. Now, I want to do that uh, in Laravel. I thought that would be easy, because Symfony has this uh, render ESI function that does this for you, has all the fallback. And I wanted to do the composition at the view layer. It turned out to be a little bit more difficult. Uh, that's why I had to spend the, this morning, I wasn't done yet this morning, like figuring out how we could do that. So what we're going to do is we're going to extract the header from, uh, from, from this group of, 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 of caching rules. I'm going to set it to private so that the output doesn't get cached. And then at the view layer, and this is what I came up with, we're going to throw this custom uh, blade directive called ESI and mention the endpoint. Now, this, of course, doesn't exist, so I had to register it myself. And the end result is that this is going to be thrown in there if there's surrogate capability. And if there's no surrogate capability, this will be happening. So we'll do an internal routing. So even if you're not sitting behind a varnish, that it will still work without breaking up. I used this package, uh, this sub request, because it was kind of hard. We figured out at the bar yesterday, thank you, Bobby, for, for assisting me, uh, figured out how to do all of that stuff. And I luckily found a package that can help me with that. So here's the codes. Of course, codes. Now I need to shut up, probably, because if you show code on the screen, people will actually read it. Uh, maybe I should guide you through it. So I have a service provider. We created a custom blade directive called ESI. We're looking at the request, if there's a surrogate capability header matching ESI. If that is the case, we return this statement. The URL comes from whatever was passed by this at ESI. And if that's not the case, we do a sub-request for the URL and get the content. Is this the cleanest way? I'm not sure. Please tell me afterwards. Uh, but it is a way of doing it elegantly without having to know whether or not you're, uh, you're in, a, in a varnish context or not. And then you could do this or that if you want to assemble all of it. And of course, I also registered a, a surrogate uh, middleware to actually do the negotiation and check, is there surrogate capability? Well, then please, let's have some surrogate control. So all little bits and pieces, maybe we can assemble this into something really nice. But for now, I just created separate stuff. Next question, I have five minutes left. How do you identify an object in the cache? Any, any takers, any ideas? How, what does HTTP offer us to identify a request or an object? What do we have? It's very quiet, so I probably need some socks, right? I heard <laughs> someone come again. Where did that come from? Yeah. Oh, I need to throw this so far. This is gonna, I'm going to mess this up. 
See? Yes, it's true. Uh, you identify it, and this is the built-in VCL. Even if you don't have this VCL in your VCL file in Varnish, this will be the behavior. So uh, the URL, the full URL, is going to be used. So the path section and also the HTTP host. So let's take this into a specific direction. This is translations in Laravel. So let's say we have this welcome key that needs to be translated, ultimately. This is our config. Default locale English, fallback locale English. We only have English. However, we can set this automatically using this package and read from the accept language header that your browser emits. But here's the problem with Varnish. I told you, or you told me, that the URL can be used to identify an object in the cache. So it has no awareness of the language. So it's first come, first served. Accept language English, content language English. But this is stored in cache. So here comes the Dutchie, boom, English content. Big problem. And that's where the vary comes in. And that's what I showed you in the beginning. By issuing this header, Varnish is aware that it should create uh, variations based on the language. I have a little bit of extra VCL code, how to do that safely, but we don't have time. I have four minutes and 25 seconds, so let's just carry on. If you use the vary header, you will have content length NL, and life will be more or less good again. This is how we could do that. Again, very stupid middleware, uh, just set the vary header. And, and be done with it. However, you can also do all of this in VCL. Now, I'm big on developer empowerment. I'm big on portability. So that means as a developer, I want you to do all of that. Because if you decide to not use Varnish and use a different technology that also respects HTTP, well, it should all work out of the box. But you can do it in VCL. And in a lot of cases, people don't want to touch their applications anymore. Maybe we're dealing with legacy. And uh, yeah, then you, you should write some VCL. This is not the cleanest VCL, but we override the TTL. Uh, cache control can, can set this automatically. We're overriding it to an hour. Maybe the gray is to two hours. We're setting an explicit vary header with the language. Maybe the encoding as well. Maybe your browser doesn't support GZIP. Who knows? Could be the case. Maybe you're sitting behind a TLS proxy and you want to make it HTTP and HTTP as aware. And then we have all the rest. And that, ladies and gentlemen, with the three minutes that are remaining, is just the tip of the iceberg. I have so much more to tell you. I could fill an entire day talking about Varnish, talking about VCL, talking about the capabilities of it. What I want you to do is I want to guide you to the developer portal, which is uh, also the second. So the book was What Did You Do in, the, in 2020 and Parts of 21? This is What Did You Do in Last Summer? This is my developer portal project. It's available on uh, varnishsoftware.com developers. And it has a bunch of tutorials. It will grow. It also gives you information on where to find the release. Uh, where if you want to want book, like I have a physical copy, if you want to download the PDF for free, uh, you can do that as well. Uh, even with, I didn't even touch on Varnish Enterprise, which is very interesting as well. You have tons of stuff you can do on the edge. Know that like some of our clients aren't all about web acceleration. We're operating here in a, in a more of an application context, app API. Most of our big clients use our software to build huge CDNs. Some of the biggest streaming providers in the world I can't name them for contractual reasons, but I'm pretty sure there's two of them that you probably have a subscription with. They use us to accelerate their stuff. Uh, we're looking at 5G acceleration now. A lot of uh, vendors that are in the 5G space will use us as a sort of mobile edge compute. And this is a completely different world, and it surprised me when I joined Varnish Software as well. In the book, if you download it, there's even a separate chapter on making decisions on the edge, where you can turn Varnish into an authentication gateway, where you can interact with Redis, where you can do HTTP calls, where you can actually parse handlebar syntax and, and cache templates and fill them up on the edge. But again, that is stuff for another day. What I also want to do is all that stuff you can play around with. We have a bunch of images in the cloud. Uh, most of them are Varnish Enterprise images, but the cool thing about doing it in the cloud is you don't have to pay the license fee up front, so you can just play around, dick around for an hour, uh, and then uh, see what you can do with that. Uh, just play, play with it. Here's the information. We have it on Amazon. As you can see it with the logos on Amazon, on Azure, on Google Cloud. So this is a good place to play. Uh, on these, these are not monetized, so you get Varnish Cash there. And as promised, I still have that uh, Varnish 6 by example book. So uh, I'm not sure if we have raffle opportunities at the end. If we don't, I'm going to do something strategic with my remaining moment, minute. I'm going to put it here. And someone is going to pick that up when I say thank you. <laughs> not yet. So thank you. <laughs> I was afraid. I was afraid of being like needing 45 minutes for this. I have no 48 seconds left. So maybe we even have a question. Who knows? You mentioned that you don't, didn't want Q&A, but I got a question. Well, then we do Q&A because I was afraid I needed all my time. So Striker B is asking, any tips 
for the cases when the data lies to you. Example, in regard to performance, preservation, uh, prevention of survivor bias, more caching, more problems. Yes, uh, and that's the problem. Now, we should realize in computer science that it's all cache from the CPU all the way down. So we realize that, and we realize that we use caching within our application, maybe file system, memory. That is, you should manage that. And the most important thing about caching is not having it in cache and having all these caches. That's not the problem. The real problem is invalidating it at the proper time. So I know Laravel has some things, and, and I think it's the appropriate time to advocate Freak's uh, varnish package, which we will be discussing later on how we can improve it, but that would be a good one, because it, it's good, it's really good, but there's always room for slight improvements. Uh, right, Freak? It's, it's top-notch, right? It's top-notch. But what you can do then is integrate that in Laravel and ensure that if you start using commands to erase the cache, that all the bits and pieces are done. Now, my main advice would be if you're having a lot of visitors on there, like, don't do it in, in Laravel itself because your Apache engine next PHP runtime will run out of breath real quick. So put a, a reverse caching proxy or a CDN or whatever you have. It's, it's the most important advice. And the other caches you can sacrifice if you want to reduce the complexity. But if we can join it all together and have a good way of it validating, that's your best possible outcome. Okay. Thank you. Another question for an anonymous user. We're among friends. Why be anonymous? This is friendly environment. Just don't mind the anonymous user. Uh, can you just show the book once again? Yeah. Could you find a smaller example? <laughs> well, uh, yes, I could. But here's the deal. You get stuck at the house for a year and a half, two years. You start writing in Mar I wrote this in Markdown on GitHub. And then used Pandoc to convert this into a Word document that I thought it would be a 300 page. But then it ended up being a 500 pager in my manuscript. Then I sent it to the designer. They put their layout on it, and it was 778 pages. So, yeah, <laughs> I don't know. Yes, I could, but I wanted to be pretty complete. Uh, and I went a bit overboard, not oh, knowing the dimension. It is complete. All right. So I probably need to get off stage uh, now. One last question. I have socks. To one last question from Kaneko. I have a hole in my sock, so. Yeah, here we go. You've earned this. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Want to throw it? Uh, I'll, I'll, the... While the other speaker is setting up, we have a next speaker probably, yeah, yeah. right? I'm gonna lay this out here, like <laughs> feeding the ducks, right? <laughs> and uh, thank you. I, I will I will disconnect my laptop now, so that the next speaker has the time to set up. And meanwhile, uh, we'll, we'll we'll make sure these socks find their way. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed being here. You were an awesome crowd, and yes, I do say that to all audiences. But you were pretty awesome. Please thank you, Thais. <laughs>